Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Orange United Methodist. We are excited that you have decided to come and worship our amazing God with us this morning. Please stand. We're going to go ahead and sing this morning.
Good morning, I'm Pastor Corey, uh, the Associate Minister here at Orange, and we are so happy uh, that you have joined us this morning to worship God as a family. So, uh, we do have just a few things we want to draw your attention to. If you came in, you got a bulletin, and in that bulletin there are lots of announcements, lots of things that are going on in the life of our church. Um, but if this is your first Sunday, we are especially excited that you are here. We invite you to stop by our welcome table. Uh, next to the door, we have a gift we'd like to give to you as a sign of our appreciation um, and excitement and also to give you more information uh, about the small groups and what's happening in the life of our church between Sunday and Sunday. We do want to uh, mention just a few um, Today, after church, from 12.30 to 2.30 in the new hut, we're going to have a new members workshop. So if you have been attending and feel like you might uh, be, that God might be leading you to join Orange in a formal context, uh, and you want to learn more about that, there's no requirement if you come and you listen. Uh, but we'd love to share with you what it means to be uh, a member here. Also, if you're a member of a, of a church, that you moved away from and that was your your family's church and that you have a lot of ties there and you don't want to uh, sever your membership there to become a member here but you want to share that membership you are also invited uh, to come and learn more we have a, an associate and affiliate member status that allows you to be part of two congregations if you're not uh, geographically close and likewise if you're from a different denomination uh, and you uh, want to have uh, another membership here as well, say, like my husband, who is a United Church of Christ, um, he'd be an affiliate member here at Orange uh, while he's here. So if you're interested in any of those options, we invite you to be there. There'll be child care and pizza. So, uh, yeah, both. Uh, so come on up. Also, uh, this coming Friday, our Women's Everything Happens uh, Book club is meeting at Tara Anderson's house, so if you'd like to be a part of that, just email the church office by Wednesday. We're reading Becoming Human by Jean Bonnier. It's a short, quick read, so you are welcome to join us. And then for our kids, we have uh, t-shirt orders open right now uh, for, for our toddlers through our elementary. If you want an orange kids t-shirt, Please let Diana know. Uh, they're ten dollars a piece in their baseball T-shirts, so uh, we'd love for you to grab one of those. And finally, for one day with God, it's coming up very quickly. Thank you so much. They have gotten all of their uh, "This is what we need" cards fulfilled. But if you'd like to donate um, financially, please. Uh, Pat has invited you all to stop by the table, and um, he'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, those are all our announcements. There are more in the bulletin. Also, if you want to receive those announcements during the week, we invite you to make sure you are on our email list. And at this time, I'll invite our ushers to pass out those attendance pads. Let us know you're here. We keep track of that. Uh, and make sure your neighbor lets us know they're here. And if you get a chance, look at the pad and find out your neighbor's name while it's coming down. But if you have a need, a prayer request or anything like that, let us know there as well. Um, but if you want to be added to that email list, this is a great way. And as you are passing those attendance pads, uh, why don't you go ahead and greet your neighbor and pass the peace in Christ's name. <laughs>
rest alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
guys can pray with me. God, your word says that we are finite. We fade like grass. And so often we forget that you are eternal. You cover us. You were there far from when we were there. You'll still be here when we fade away. pray that this morning we would remember you are the God we are not. We are the clay. You are the pot. You created us. You formed us. You looked on us in love in our helpless estate and decided that we needed to be saved because of your unfailing enduring love. We give you thanks and we give you praise for that. We pray these things. Amen. You can have a seat. We are truly blessed here at Orange with so much talent of uh, people that are willing to offer themselves up to help lead us in worship. And I give thanks for Josh and the way that he leads this band and leads us. And today, I don't know if you were paying attention, but uh, we had a band that was taking place out in the congregation. I love when children are able to embrace what it means to be a part of worship. And as they grab some of the, the noisemakers, the shakers, and the uh, tambourines, it was a beautiful sound to me. Uh, because in that, we are learning what it's like to truly worship God with reckless abandon. This morning, our scripture lesson comes from Amos. We're looking at one of these Old Testament passages from one of the uh, minor prophets. And by the way, I just realized something. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Adam C. You may not know me yet. That's okay. We'll get to know each other. Please feel free every time I speak to you uh, to share with me your name still. I'm still working on those. I'm getting there, but it still takes some time. And so thank, thank you. If you're wearing a name tag, that's helpful. It's just sometimes I've already studied some of the old pictorial directories, and some of you <laughs> have changed a little bit. <laughs> and so uh, the name tags are helpful. When I, Hopefully we'll get our new pictorial directory sometime soon. I don't really have an update on that, but I know I keep hearing about it. And so hopefully we'll get that together. But once again, I'm Adam C., lead pastor here at Arch, and I'm so excited to be able to worship with you this morning. And so our Old Testament passage, back to what I was talking about. Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. It's towards the back of the Old Testament if you have any trouble finding that. And it's also going to be up here on the screen. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And so if you have another translation, that's great. Read along in that capacity, how you have it. Because it, mine may be worded in one way. But the way that you hear it, and then the way that you read it on the page in front of you. Or, well, I believe we also have New Revised Standard up here as well. And sometimes it just speaks to us in different ways. So hear this Old Testament passage from Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. This is what the Lord God showed me a basket of summer fruit he said Amos what do you see and I said a basket of summer fruit and then the Lord said to me the end has come upon my people Israel I will never again pass them by the songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day says the Lord God the dead bodies shall be many cast out in every place be silent Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and, the, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? And everyone mourn who lives in it. And all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning. And all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth 
on all loins and baldness on every head. Amen. And I will make it. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't in there. <laughs> I will make it like the morning for only an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God. And I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Sometimes it's hard to hear this, but let me say this. This, too, is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this word. A word that it sounds scary and intimidating. A word that is filled with such vivid language, Lord, that maybe we're not really even sure what to do with that. But even in that, Lord, your love is there. Your love that never fails. Your love that always remains. And so we thank you for your word as it was shared and written so long ago and yet still speaks to us even here and now. And as we've heard it and received it, Lord, may you continue to speak now in these moments that we share together. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you transform the words that proceed from my mouth and as they fall upon our ears and penetrate our hearts, may they be changed into a word of God that we need to hear today as individuals and collectively as one body. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said. Amen. Growing up as the son of a United Methodist pastor, I grew up in different places across North Carolina. I've always thought of Wilmington and Raleigh as the two places that I called home growing up, primarily because that was where I spent my teenage years, and then I graduated from high school in Raleigh, and so I always thought of Wilmington and Raleigh as home, and when I was growing up as a teenager in Wilmington, one of the things I loved to do was I loved to go to the beach, obviously, and I loved to, to surf. Some of you might not, you might look at me and think, no way. I used to be able to surf, and so I, I, I used to love to go to the beach. I had a, I have a sister that's two years older than me, and before I could drive, I was always begging her, Amy, please take me to the beach. Please take me to the beach. And the time that I especially wanted to go to the beach was when I heard about a tropical storm or a hurricane that was coming up the coast. I mean, it was crazy. You'd hear about a tropical storm or a hurricane, and you knew that the waves would be churning at Wrightsville Beach. And so I just had to get to the beach. I begged my mom and dad, and my mom and dad would say, okay. And it was crazy. I mean, as a parent, why would they let me do that? And so, sure enough, they drive me down to the beach. And guess what? The water was full. The water was full of surfers and boogie boards. People were all out there taking advantage of the waves that we didn't normally have. And it reminded me, it, it, recently I saw a meme uh, on the internet that is funny to me in a lot of ways. Let, let's pull this up real quick. Uh, North Carolina's reaction to snow. <laughs> And you see the bare bread shelves as people run out when we hear about snow. We got to go to the grocery store, got to make sure we get our milk and our bread because we got to have milk sandwiches when the snow hits. And so we run out to buy stuff because we're going to shelter down for the snow. But when it's a hurricane, man, people flock to the beach. And I always love how the news people send people to the beach. And they always encounter some guys that, yeah, I'm going to run it out. <laughs> Really, is that a smart thing? I mean, we hear these warnings. We hear these significant warnings that come about winter weather that a lot of times we don't hardly pay attention to, or maybe we do pay attention to. Or we hear about the warnings about the weather and how a hurricane or a tropical storm is coming. Stay out of the water. Stay away. Batten down the hatches. And some people are just going to not pay attention to the warnings. You know, we're surrounded by warnings all the time that a lot of times we just really don't pay any attention to. Just a few weeks ago, I rented a box truck to bring some of my stuff from Goldsboro over to our new house. And this box truck had in it a lane assist. Y'all familiar with the lane assist that if you start across the line, you get a beep, beep, beep. And so I kept hearing that beep, beep, beep as I'm driving this big truck down I-40. And, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I felt like I was a big dude. And, and I hear that beep, beep, beep. And, and eventually I just turned up the radio. 
Because I knew I wasn't crossing the line. Yes, I was getting close, but I wasn't crossing the line. I just ignored the warnings. We have warnings all around us, all the times that we hear, but we don't necessarily pay attention to all the warnings. And the times that we really don't pay attention to a warning is when everything seems to be going good. My sons used to play a lot of soccer. We traveled all over playing soccer, and it was amazing. We'd be out there for a soccer game, and the weather might look perfect. Everything was going well, and our team might even be winning. But all of a sudden, the referee uh, might have gotten a signal that there was a thunderstorm within a certain amount of space, and he would blow the whistle and make everybody clear the field. I would get so mad unless our team was losing. It was a good thing then. But when everything was going good for us, I was so mad to have to hear this warning. Lightning's nowhere near. What I didn't really realize at the time is lightning doesn't have to be right over you. A thunderstorm doesn't have to be right over you to be struck by lightning. A lightning strike can take place up to, I think, about five miles away from the center of a thunderstorm. And so they had information that I didn't necessarily have when they gave that warning and made us get off the field. But I didn't want to listen to them. Any of you ever hear that? Maybe your doctor gives you a warning, says, you know what, you need to cut this out of your diet, or you need to start doing this. We hear those warnings and we think, eh, I'll do what I think is best for me. And especially when everything seems to be going good, it's easy for us to ignore those warnings that are there. Those warnings that are actually given for our benefit we just may not want to pay attention to them in that moment. And you know, like parents, we offer warnings to our children that uh, there may be consequences to this behavior. Uh, we're trying to warn you, don't touch the hot stove. And we're really not trying to punish the child. We're trying to tell the child, don't touch the hot stove. Because if you touch the hot stove, there will be consequences. And not the kind that you're going to be punished. You're just going to get burned. We offer warnings, and so we can understand in God's Word, God oftentimes gives warnings. God gives warnings when there are times that, that maybe there are behaviors that lead us away from God. And God may sense that we're crossing a line. God may sense that we're going out of our lane. And so God gives these warnings and says, hey, 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 beep, beep, beep. These kind of things are leading you away from where I want you to be. These things are leading you further away from me. And I want you right here with me all the time. I don't want you to stray. I want you to be right here with me. And so the people of Israel, throughout the Old Testament, we see so many times God is having to give these warnings. Because remember, the people of Israel were called to be set apart. They were set apart to be a nation that was blessed by God. A nation that was obedient to them, and obedience precedes blessing. And it wasn't just that they were to be set apart so that everybody would say, oh, look at them, they're cool. Uh, it was to be set apart, to be blessed, so that everybody might look at them and say, you know what? I want what they've got. That's all. I want that peace. I want that joy. I want that celebration. I want that that they have. I want that relationship with God like what they have. And so Israel was always supposed to be the set-apart nation that was drawing others to God. That was bearing witness. But many times what was happening instead was God was seeing they were straying out of the lane. And there were behaviors that were leading them out of the lane that they were coming away from God. And here in Amos, we get some of these sort of laid out pretty thick and heavy. And God is saying, you know what? I'm fed up. Here's what the people have been doing. It says that they were listening to, uh, they were observing the Sabbath, but on the Sabbath, they were counting down the minutes for the end of the Sabbath so that they could go back to the marketplace. Because at this point in history, Israel and Judah, they were, at the, they were so prosperous. Everything was going so great. And so that moment of the Sabbath that they couldn't go to the market and make extra money. I mean, they were counting down the minutes for the end of Sabbath. They were counting down the minutes of the, every feast that they were celebrating. I mean, they were going through the motions of practicing their religion. It just wasn't real. Because they just couldn't wait to get on to the next thing. I mean, look, y'all may not believe this, but I've heard of some churches, not this one, but I've heard of some churches that in worship, that people actually will pay attention to their watch. I know not this one. I've known of some churches that will put a, a clock, a big clock on the back, 
so the pastor can pay attention to the time. Because uh, we can't wait to get out to go to Sunday school, right? Right? That's where we're going next. We want to get on to the next thing sometimes. Not this church, but some churches are that way. And so the people of Israel were that way. They could not wait for the Sabbath to be over. They could not wait for the feast to be over because they had to get to the market. And then when they got to the market, did you pay attention? And one of the things that they're doing, they are cheating people out of their money. They are using uh, smaller shekel, uh, well, larger shekels. They're weighing on the grain uh, as they're doing the grain. They're doing smaller bushels. And they're, they're having a smaller container here and a heavier shekel. So they're making extra profit, doubly extra profit. They are cheating. And if you pay attention, man, it's a word that actually speaks to us very contemporary. They're cheating the poor, hurting the needy. I mean, they're just being cast aside and run over, all in the name of prosperity. Look what's happening to us. Oh, this is good. Now let's get on with it. God has warned. God has says, you've strayed out of your lane. Beep, beep, beep. You have strayed out of your lane. I've given you this warning. And you are not where I need you to be. I need you to be where you are vertical. And I need you to be where you're outward focused. Where you're leading people to me. But they've strayed out of their lane so much. And now their focus is only in them. It's only about me. And God says in very harsh words, done. Done. Man, as I read through some of those words, I bet some of y'all are thinking, boy, I came to church to feel uplifted today. He's talking about scattering the dead, the songs of the, <laughs> the palace, I mean, turning into wailing. Woohoo! <laughs> Here's the thing, though. See, the same God that issued these strong, strong, important words, the same God that gave these warnings to his people that he loved, is the same God that said, There's nothing you can ever do that will separate me from your love, from my love for you. That this is the same God, the same God that gave that warning, those strong, heartfelt warnings of, of come back, repent, I've been begging you, come back to me, is the same God. That came to us in the form of Jesus Christ. Say, come to me. I don't care how far you've strayed. Your behaviors that have led you away. I know that you have just become separated from me. But I'm coming to bring you back to me. The same God that gave those warnings. Is the same God that says, I love you no matter what. There's nothing that I won't do. All the way to the point of sending my only son to come alongside you and bring you back. Now that's a word that I'm so thankful for. I'm so thankful to have a God that loves me so much. He's going to come back for me. No matter how far I've gone astray. Several years ago, when my sons were very little, Jacob, our oldest son, and he's not here today so I can talk about him. Not like it's going to be on the internet, right? Um, so Jacob was very little. He was just a toddler. Aaron was an infant. And so we were at a Chick-fil-A. So you know it wasn't a, what day of the week? Sunday. Sunday, that's right. They weren't counting down the minutes so they could get opened up again. It, it was a day of the week. It was, and it was a crowded time. We were there. And this Chick-fil-A that we were at had an indoor playground. Y'all have seen those, right? The Chick-fil-A indoor playground. And this one, it had the indoor playground. It was completely walled off by glass. So everybody inside the restaurant could look through that glass and see the children playing. And there was a few tables in that area that you could go and you could sit and eat and watch your children play. And they'd climb and they do all kinds of fun stuff. And, and Jacob was in there and we we're tending to eating our, our meal while Jacob was up playing on the indoor playground. And Aaron, just a little baby, he's sitting there watching, wanting, waiting for his moment. And so I'm watching Jacob and Jacob starts trying to climb to sections that he's not able really to get to. I mean, that's what children do. They see other children getting up higher and Jacob's trying to get to a little section that he could not get to on his own. But guess what? There was a child there that said, oh, I can help you. 
And so this child reaches down to help him up to the next stage. And I remember calling out, Jacob, Jacob, beep, 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 Jacob, don't do that. Don't get up there. You won't be able to get down. But Jacob looks at us. <laughs> and he goes to the next little section where the little child helps him up to the next section. And Jacob looks at us. Jacob, come down, come down. And Jacob's looking at us. <laughs> goes on up a little bit higher. He gets all the way to the top of this indoor playground. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, well, you got yourself into this mess. What are you going to do now? And then the little child who had helped him get all the way to the top, Mama comes into the glass and says, Sally, it's time to go. And Sally, <laughs> running out the door, leaving Jacob up there at the top. And that look of on his face. And you know what I did? I said, you got yourself into this mess? You can get yourself down. I warned you, and you didn't listen to me. Forget you. <laughs> Clearly, I didn't do that, right? <laughs> so I'm looking, I'm trying to tell, all right, Jacob, listen to me. I try to send another child, you know, tell him how to come down. And he's like, oh, and he starts crying. Oh, it breaks my heart. I can't stand to hear my child crying. I'm seeing him cry. But I'm looking up there and I'm thinking, there's no way a 200-pound man needs to climb up this indoor playground. And then I get up and I start to climb. And I look and I see inside the restaurant. You know what everybody's doing? <laughs> They're watching me, and I climb, and I'm just I'm so ashamed. I mean, I feel like a child climbing, but there's nothing that's going to stop me from getting to my boy. He's crying. He's lost. He's gotten where I didn't want him to be. There's nothing that was going to stop me from getting to him and bringing him back. And as I came back with my son, I was reminded that's what my Jesus Christ did. That when I strayed, I heard all the warnings. I was told, oh, don't do this. It'll lead you away from God. I listened. I heard. But it didn't sink into my heart. Until finally I got to a point that I realized I was in a place that I could not find my way back. And it was in that moment that my Jesus came. And I said, God, I can't do this on my own. Bring me back to you. And Jesus came. Form of a child. Humbled himself was mocked and ridiculed, full of shame. All because of love that he has for the one that cried out to him. See, the same God that gave those warnings is the same God that said, there's nothing I won't do to come to you. And that today is a word that I need to be reminded of. Maybe today, maybe you found yourself, you've gone across the lane. <laughs> Maybe there's certain parts of our lives that we, we found ourselves out of bounds. We've had warnings. We've heard. Maybe there are certain parts of our lives that have led us away from our relationship with God. Maybe things have been so good in our lives that maybe we've neglected our prayer life. And then suddenly the bottom drops out. and We realize we're at the top of the playground. And we don't know how to get back. Maybe today is that day that we cry, Lord. Same. Maybe we have strayed so far from that lane and we have found ourselves in such a horrible situation where there's nobody else around. You know, it's amazing how when everything is going great, there's people all around, but then sometimes when the bottom drops out, nobody's there to help us. And maybe we find ourselves and we're so filled with this guilt and this shame and we don't know how to come back and we, we don't even think that we're worth Him coming up there coming to us. There's nothing He wouldn't do to come for you. So today, let this be the, the, the day that we know that the same God that gave us those warnings is the same God that loves us so much that He comes for you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you so much for the incredible love that you do have for us. Lord, so many times your warnings, we've heard them. So many times we know. 
yet we still, we keep in our ways. And we've just found ourselves just crossing those warnings and not paying attention to them. Maybe we've found ourselves and all of a sudden everything falls apart and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to get back. As the people of Israel have had all those warnings, your love for them still was always evident. And just for us, Lord, as we've had so many warnings, your love is right there. Lord, today, maybe there's somebody here in this room that has found themselves, uh, they've heard all the warnings, but, but maybe they've just continued on, and maybe they've suddenly found themselves in a, in a situation and a circumstance that they don't know how to get back. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you might allow us to have humble hearts before you and to cry out to you, Lord, save me. I can't do this on my own. Lord, there may be other people that we have in our lives, people we love, people we have tried to talk to, people we have tried to say, come back. Today, in your mercy, would you hear our prayers as we lift that name up to you, praying that they may come back to you. And that if we might be your hands and feet, to be the ones to show them the body of Christ. To be the body of Christ. Showing them your incredible, unconditional love. Welcoming them back. Letting them know there is a place where they can be loved and welcomed and redeemed and restored. Let it be me. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers today. For we just want to be the salt of the earth, the city on the hill, the light that shines into the darkness. So that one day all may come to know the incredible love of the one who saves us. I pray this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said. Amen. In our worship, we have an opportunity to give back to God. When we give to God, we're not buying favor from God. When we give to God, we're not fulfilling uh, our dues back to the church. When we give to God, we're giving to God out of gratitude. This gratefulness for what God has given and blessed us with, we're giving to God out of gratitude for what it is God has done for us. And we're giving to God in such a way that those resources might use be used so that those that are the least, the last, and the lost might know that there's a God that loves them. And so today, as we receive this offering, I want to invite you to give with a grateful and joyful heart. And as we sing in this song and this time of offering also, today maybe you feel the need for a time of prayer. Pastor Corey and I want to be available for you. And so as we sing this song, maybe you just have something weighing so heavy on your heart that you need somebody to pray with. Now, we want to be that for you. And so as the offering is being taken up, we want to invite you, if you feel so loved, we're going to be stationed up here towards the front. I want to invite you to come to feel that call. Today, let's give it all to Him.